Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, our presentation today at the LPI staff lunch is um, uh, Paul Shank's uh, uh, award talk for the AGU's um, Fred Whipple Award. Um, Paul gave this talk at the American Geophysical Union in December, but unfortunately it was not properly recorded, so we're giving him a chance to um, both present it to all of his friends and colleagues at LPI, but also so that we can record it for posterity. Uh, the Whipple Award recognizes the significant contributions to the field of planetary science from a mid-career or senior scientist. Um, Paul uh, certainly deserves this honor. He's had a very distinguished career working mostly in the outer solar system, satellites of um, Jupiter, Saturn, um, Uranus, Neptune, um, all the way out now to Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Um, he's made many important contributions to us that I'm sure he will talk about in this uh, presentation, which he assures us really is mostly a biographical talk. Um, the title of the talk is Perseverance, Curiosity, and Opportunity in the Outer Solar System. Go ahead, Paul. Okay, thank you, Walter. And I want to thank the AGU and in particular, John Spencer, who spearheaded the uh, nomination and shepherded it through uh, for this honor. And, you know, awards are often a time for the awardee to reflect on the path that he took to get where they are. And as I thought about it, it was uh, in large part, not only the successes, but the failures uh, that define that path. And, and as uh, an elder statesman, if you will, of the, of the field, I'm hoping it provides examples for those who follow. And as I look, at my early career, uh, it struck me that basically my early years were a litany of failure. And I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, each of them was a bit of a crisis point. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is that the failures opened up opportunities uh, through a combination of hard work, uh, but also perseverance, curiosity, and a little help from friends on occasion. Uh, now, as a youth in the 1960s, I had uh, several interests that kept me going through those early days. One was diving, but, you know, I was 40 pounds underweight, and those of you who worked with me when I first moved here remember that I was really quite slender, uh, and I thought I was too frail to work as a diver. I was also deeply interested in space exploration. We are, in fact, about to land on the freaking moon. I mean, this is a very exciting time. Uh, but I had no math skills, and, and those of you who know me well know I still have no math skills. So I thought, well, there's zero chance of making that a career. But as you can see from my scrapbooks, uh, you know, back in those days, our news was from newspapers, which was actually in print on paper, which is kind of like, Kind of weird for some people, but it's like, that's how it was in those days. Um, you know, I was watching the moon landings, but I was also watching interplanetary exploration. And in those days, Voyager was and uh, had not yet left the launch pad. Uh, but I was fortunate, and our high school had a very good arts program, so uh, I I took all the art courses I could that we offered. And here's an example of one of my early uh, projects, which was a, an exercise in perspective rendering. And you can judge the quality for yourself uh, in terms of um, how successful I was. So uh, in 1976, I entered the Fine Arts School at Buffalo State. And this was a very good program, actually. It had a national reputation. And a year and a half later, I flunked out at the uh, ripe old age of eight, uh, 19 failing the practicum. And a practicum is basically an examination of your work over the first year, year and a half of your um, program and deemed not good enough. Well, there's the end of a career as a space artist. Uh, but it didn't quite end up that way. I was fortunate that uh, our, our uh, geology was in the astronomy program for some reason. But in, in other words, um, in any case, rather, um, I discovered around the same time, I don't really remember what uh, semester it was, but uh, around the same year, I discovered Geology 101 under Dr. Carl Seifert. 
And he was one of those professors that had the fire in the belly. He was just generally enthused about uh, anything uh, related to earth science, particularly plate tectonics. And he was the author of one of the most important earth science books of the time, Earth History and Plate Tectonics, which I still have a copy of. And his, his enthusiasm was like gasoline on a flame uh, in terms of my interest. He was a teacher, an author, uh, a great mentor, uh, and a great friend, and, and, and he's gone now, and I miss him. I wish he was had been here to, to, to see the presentation. But his interest uh, tapped into my long fascination with the planets. And again, remembering this is in the post-Mariner 9, but pre-Voyager days. And uh, what it showed was a, a planetary career was possible. And who needs math and geology after all? I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> at least in those days. Um, and as I said, Voyager was fast approaching. We had not been to the giant planets with a good imaging system. And as the Voyager released graphic at the uh, far right shows, our understanding of the icy satellites was very primitive. And you can examine the stylized rendition of Ganymede in the center and compare it to our current maps. And you'll see this, our understanding was really quite primitive. So there was a whole vista opening up at the time. Carl encouraged me to apply and, and in fact win a NASA JPL summer internship in the summer of 1979. And I still have the award letter and the envelope it came in as part of my mementos. The interesting thing about that was that it was not for the imaging team. It was for the Voyager Science Support Team, which was the group of people, uh, hardworking, extremely dedicated. Every mission has a group like this that actually takes the requested observations from the various uh, teams, including the imaging team, and turns them into actually executable commands to send to the spacecraft. It is really impossible to underestimate the importance of that summer to uh, uh, my future career. Uh, it it uh, threw me right in the middle of, of the fire pit and showed uh, me how a mission actually operates, what is actually necessary to make it uh, happen. And that was illuminating and exciting and it was just an incredible summer. And I remember that so well that uh, I made it a point to later mentor summer interns. And here's a short list of some of the examples and there are, several, there are quite a few more uh, that don't fit on the page. Uh, and, and I note that um, uh, through the wisdom of the AGU, Ryan Ewing, who is the second person on the list, was actually scheduled to chair a session at the exact same time I was scheduled to give my presentation. So I was like, hmm, okay. Um, but that be that as it may. Again, an exciting summer. Uh, that uh, summer actually indirectly uh, bore fruit in future research. Uh, one of the things, the main thing I was actually tasked to do was to compile a report uh, that was um, a description, if you will, of uh, the planned observations for Saturn, which Voyager had not yet gotten to. And one of those things was to plot the uh, predicted observations of what the imaging system was going to observe on the Saturnian satellites using, a, uh, using graph paper, a ruler, and a protractor. Uh, High-tech uh, here. But it was a simple exercise, and it wasn't intended to really be uh, high precision, but it was intended to show where the uh, planned coverage was going to be on the Saturnian satellites and where the uh, gaps in the coverage were, and whether it was important enough to uh, change the plans in order to fill those gaps. And this just shows on the right uh, an example of one of those plots, uh, very simple, but elegant and simple, uh, sorry, uh, direct and, and it did the job but again it's all sometimes all you need is a ruler and protractor but uh in the future i would end up uh taking uh, voyager images and uh, uh, further down cassini images and making my own maps of the saturnian satellites and in this case uh, enceladus 
the other thing that happened during the summer was that uh, this was uh, the Voyager 2 encounter with Jupiter. Uh, and I arrived two weeks before the encounter, so it was a, a beehive of activity. And we were in the conference room, and I remember this very much. Uh, we were uh, watching the monitors because we were expecting the first high resolution images of Europa to show up, and this is one of those images. And, uh, and decades later, I would actually be using these images and Galileo images to uh, to uh, do additional mapping on Europa. So it all started there. And uh, now you may wonder where the science comes in, and this is where it comes into the end of the story. Uh, when I got back home, you know, I had all these press release images, and the image at the left is, in fact, a uh, lithograph, a, a print, a by ten print of the best Voyager image of Europa at the time. Is the only one we had really. And I remember I, I showed this to Carl, my uh, Carl Seifert, my my professor, and we projected it up on the on the blackboard. And I can remember it distinctly. We were talking about trying to figure out what this crazy quilt of, of linear patterns meant, because it didn't, you look at it, it just doesn't make any sense when you first, first look at it. It's just crazy a cross board of, of, of lineations and lines all crisscrossing in a bizarre pattern, no sense out of it. As we looked at it, we realized we were starting to see a pattern. And if you look at the red circle, you see there's a line, dark line cutting across it, but there's several uh, thinner lines that are uh, cross cut by it. And you can actually uh, do rotations and realign many of the features on the map, uh, indicating that the, the blocks separated by the large dark lines had actually been formed by rotations of plates. Large plates about 100 kilometers across with about 25 kilometers of displacement. And we thought, wow, this is exciting. First example of strike slip faulting and plate motion on another planet. We were really excited about this. Uh, but was it evidence for floating ice shell? That's where we got into trouble. So we went to uh, present our results at the 1980 AGU meeting in Toronto. This was back when they had a, um, a spring meeting, as always on the East Coast. And we presented it, and we were fairly well received, and we actually had discussions with, with team members. It was kind of a little on the awkward side because we were not actually on the imaging team, and we were only using the press release images. We did not have access to the digital imagery at that point. I make a note, though, that the person follow, uh, the presenters following us were Malash and McKinnon, and that uh, is actually of some interest in the in, in the following uh, in, in the rest of the story, and we'll get to that in a second. So uh, we submitted a manuscript to, of all places, Nature Magazine. We were sort of ambitious; we didn't really know what we were doing, and I was again only an undergraduate. Uh, but the story seems significant enough, you know, plate mobility on another planet, well, that does, you know, still seem significant. Uh, but uh, we got rejected not once, but twice. And it was a, a, one of those life lessons, of course. Uh, and, and as I was reading the reviews, uh, I still have them, they're here behind me in my office. Uh, I invite you to read some of these. Uh, some of the quotes are rather uh, interesting, as totally inappropriate for work of previous investigators to be dismissed on the basis of such casual pontifications. An author's personal preference is not recognized as a sound scientific premise. If Paul can bring to bear a little broader viewpoint, well, ouch. Um, publication would be detrimental to an author's reputation. Uh, and my favorite, uh, the Volcanic Ridge hypothesis, is something close to astro fantasy. Well, you know, um, that's enough to uh, discourage anybody. And, and I can assure you, as I was preparing this, reading those reviews was as painful today as it was back then. But the fact is, they were essentially correct. Uh, our, our root story was, was 
correct in the fact that we were observing these displacements, but we were uh, sort of leaping ahead of ourselves and overinterpreting some of the uh, uh, observations in terms of the interior structure and uh, state of uh, uh, the interior of Europa. And we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. So we needed a little extra, uh, we, we needed something more. We, we needed, um, a, like, he, like they said, a broader viewpoint. And, and that's where uh, the next step of the uh, education process comes in. Uh, in fact, I was rejected at Washington University uh, uh, initially, uh, but on appeal that was overturned because uh, in the middle of the uh, application process, I had retaken my GREs and gotten a much better score, but they didn't wait. Um, but I was able to overturn that. And yes, that was very important as it turns out because Bill McKinnon arrived at WashU exactly the same week as I did as a brand new assistant professor. And that turns out to, to be of, of great importance. I was originally uh, planning to work with Ray Arvidsson, who is of course a, a Mars guy and not quite as interested in the outer solar system as I was. So in, in fact, as, as Spock has said, random chance in this case appeared to operate in my favor in the fact that I didn't know Bill was going to be a professor uh, when I applied, but it turned out to be critical because in six months I became a student and we we're both interested in icy uh, objects in the solar system, so perfect. So we retooled and resubmitted the Europa plate tectonics paper and went through three more review cycles. It, in this case, we submitted it to Icarus. And so finally, nine years after it was first submitted, it was published in, in, in Icarus, 1989. With the benefit of more sophisticated mapping, you can see an example here, more realistic and restrained interpretations, basically extensive shell dilation, pulling apart of the shell, basically a giant rift zone, if you will. 100 kilometers of new ice, uh, icy shell materials was created in that zone. And it clearly suggests that the ice shell is mobile and warm. It doesn't conclusively say that there's an ocean that required Galileo observations. But uh, it was very satisfying, of course, when Galileo high resolution images proved our observations correct. That we had to wait uh, about a decade for that to happen though. So uh, lessons learned. Okay, so persevere when events or your results are discouraging. Learn from those uh, discouraging developments, but seek your path. And remember, in in or many of you don't under, don't know, but in 1982, uh, planetary exploration was basically in a state of uh, decay almost. There was only one mission flying and that was Voyager and one mission approved that was Galileo. The outlook was, was considered bleak by, by many people. But of course, we're in a much more robust state now, happily. Make your observations robust, double check them, test them. Always temper your conclusions to, to be based on uh, what you know and what we don't know. Uh, uh, Make, make, make sure that they are, are properly couched in, uh, in our understanding of our limitations. And la, uh, most importantly, don't take reviews personally. Uh, oftentimes, uh, negative reviews are actually based on an, an incomplete description of our results, and we need to actually uh, improve on those. Know your data's limits, but interrogate all possible data. Be curious, and that leads us to the next section, which is curiosity. And flash forward 20 years, I'm at the uh, Lunar Planetary Institute, and, and I'll get a little bit into that story uh, shortly. And I've become known for topographic mapping and stereo views of icy satellites uh, in the outer solar system using a variety of tools, including stereogrammetry and photoconometry. And here are just some examples of some of the work I've done. Uh, and uh, one of those projects was mapping of the Saturnian satellites from PDS data in the early part of the Cassini image mission, including mapping of the, the ridge structure on Iapetus, uh, the low plains and Danone, 
and, and the other satellites. And these, uh, these two maps are topographic maps, dark is low and bright is high. So this is a high ridge on, on a famous high ridge on Iapetus. And we also found a surprise at Enceladus, the active moon of Saturn, and that there are these large deep depressions that are a kilometer and a half deep, uh, about 100, 100, 150 kilometers wide. But I had no plans to do any color mapping whatsoever. That was not uh, something that was of particular interest at this time. I just I was heavily focused on the topographic mapping, and color didn't really enter into it uh, until I was uh, surprised by uh, some things that I saw. One is that uh, part of the effort that I was, under, uh, that I was um, uh, working on was to map crater morphologies on the icy satellites to see how deep they were and whether we were seeing evidence of relaxation or degradation or any of those other things. And Rhea is one of the outer moons of Saturn. It's cratered wasteland. It has a uh, fracture belt on the on the uh, trailing hemisphere, but it's mainly, as you can see, heavily cratered body. I was processing this five frame stereo mosaic that you see on the far left and seeing craters everywhere, and using this to, to determine crater depths of all sizes so we get some depth diameter statistics. So I was wondering, what else can be teased from this data set? Is there anything that I'm missing? Are there any correlations, for example, between color and topography? I mean, the true reason I actually looked at this was because I think stereo views look better when you have true color rather than black and white. So I was just curious whether we were seeing anything. So I processed the uh, color images that went with this five frame mosaic. Uh, it has three color components, uh, infrared, near infrared, uh, ultraviolet, and green. And you can see that there are color variations across the scene. There, it becomes more purplish uh, in exaggerated color, that is, at the bottom, at the south, and a more greenish uh, towards the north. There's also some bluish rims. Some of the craters have bluish rims, which I thought was interesting. But then I noticed this odd thing right in this area here, sort of a bluish patch. And bluish, in this case, means that it uh, has a stronger uh, ultraviolet than infrared signature relative to the other trains surrounding it. It's a relative color difference. So I thought, what does this color patch mean? What does this, uh, my curiosity, in other words, got the best out of me. So I looked at it, it's like really kind of a strange patch. There's some blue material on, on the crater rims there, uh, over here and over here, but there's also a general bluish coloring. And then I looked at the location, it's one degree north of the equator, and that is really sort of suspicious. Why would there be a blue patch on the equator? Okay, that's kind of interesting. Remember, we had already known about the ridge, uh, equatorial ridge on Iapetus, so it's like, hmm. Curious, are there more of these spots? Well, okay, so I looked at some other color uh, maps of Rhea and found, yes, there in fact, oh, there's a whole bunch of them. And there's another blue spot here, and it's all along this, uh, along the equator again in this region. This is to the, uh, to the east of the previous location and to the west, you also see some additional, they're darker and uh, again, more bluish. So it turns out that there's a whole string of these, and I call them the blue pearls of Rhea, uh, all along the equator. And it turns out that the topography from the stereo was important to understanding this, because these blue spots all form on topographic highs. The inference is that these are deposits, um, thin deposits, more regular disruption, if probably is what's really going on disruptions of the surface due to the impact of ring particles from an extinct ring, that is, that spiral down very slowly and gradually until they hit the highest parts of the surface and disturb and disrupt the regolith. And that's pretty interesting to see a ring formed around another uh, small uh, planetary body in orbit around another larger planet. So having a uh, ring around a satellite actually strengthens the uh, 
argument that the ridge on Iapetus formed from an extinct ring around that body as well. So that's pretty interesting. You also have the hemispheric color pattern I alluded to in the earlier slide. And uh, so that led to, uh, again, curiosity. It's like, okay, what other color patterns are we seeing on the rest of these satellites? And it turns out there's a whole bunch of things going on on the Saturnian satellites. On uh, Mimas, unfortunately, this slide's a little small, so you can't really see it, but on Mimas and on Tethys, you have these equatorial lenses, lens-shaped um, color patterns. And it turns out they're all, all always on the leading hemisphere near the equator, and they're formed by high-energy electrons that spiral in towards the surface on, uh, on the crazy patterns that strike only the uh, equatorial regions of those hemispheres. And shortly after this, um, uh, the uh, infrared uh, mapping uh, Sears is the name of the instrument on uh, Cassini observed a, an anomalous uh, thermal pattern on Mimas that corresponded exactly to the color pattern that we were seeing, confirming that in fact, the surface is being altered by high energy electrons in that way. You also see these uh, hemispheric patterns, darker and redder on the trailing hemisphere and sort of brighter and also redder on the leading hemispheres. And there's a competition going on here between uh, deposition of E-ring material on the leading hemispheres and deposition and alteration by the magnetospheric uh, uh, particles uh, hitting the trailing hemisphere. So there's a complex pattern there. And we're also seeing in these color maps plume deposition, uh, particularly as magenta uh, material, magenta shaped, I'm sorry, magenta colored material uh, on Enceladus, which is due to deposition of um, erupting plume material uh, on Enceladus driven by gravity, uh, cryptic red streaks on uh, Tethys, which could be due to active fract fracturing, all sorts of things. And all of this happened uh, from simply being curious while making a simple stereo elevation map. The lesson being learned again is to interrogate the data as completely and as fully as is permitted by the data in hand. Uh, just use all the data that you can and interrogate everything and you will always be surprised by, by something. But in the course of making the color maps, it, it, it has always struck me that there are amazing patterns that are evident on the surfaces of, of, these, of these planetary bodies. And Mars is, is a classic example, but the icy satellites are, 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 are no, no, um, uh, no shirkers on, on this regard as well. Uh, just uh, when you add the color, you add a certain naturalness to the images that the black and white images sometimes lack. But you see examples here uh, and here and here. This is Rhea, this is uh, Enceladus, uh, Rhea again, and then on the far right is um, uh, Triton. There are beautiful color patterns relating to the geology. And my personal favorite happens to be the, uh, this part of uh, Europa, which was viewed under high sun. Uh, I call this uh, from my Jackson Pollock period, it makes Europa look like somebody, uh, this great celestial painter, if, it, if you will, uh, dribbled paint on the surface, much in the same way that Jackson Pollock made his paintings. But it's just very beautiful, uh, rich, colorful patterns, uh, all of them different. Uh, so uh, my feeling and my recommendation is that mapping should not hide these wonders, but should uh, but should highlight them, it, and we should let this uh, let this artisticness, if you will, this artistic side inform and amplify our mapping uh, whenever possible. Because many of the patterns that result uh, show us things that we would not have known are going on. The the color patterns on the Saturnian satellites being uh, a great example of that, uh, revealing. Uh, strange phenomenon that we would never have known 
uh, occur. Uh, so uh, all that, the topographic mapping, the Saturn color mapping, all that would not have happened but for another failure. And this goes back, uh, stepping backwards in time again, to the postdoc uh, position I had at JPL uh, in the late 1980s. This was after I graduated from WashU, and I thought, well, this is my dream job. I wanted to work at JPL permanently. In fact, I still think of JPL as a great place. It's the cockpit. It's the epicenter of, of uh, planetary exploration. It's not the only center, but it's, it's one of the main centers. Uh, it's a great place. But uh, when the postdoc ended, I had to find a place to work because uh, I was declined when I applied to be permanently hired in a science position. And this created something of a crisis moment because there weren't too many great opportunities in those days. Uh, and most of those opportunities would have diverted me from active science work. I would have been involved in mission support or, or, or something else that would not have kept me involved in the science that I wanted to do. Uh, so I went to Matt Gallenbeck, who was my thesis advisor, and he said, well, maybe you should apply at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. And my response was, uh, uh, as closely as I can remember, is that no way in hell am I moving to Houston, Texas. Uh, and I've since changed my mind about that. But um, at that time, I did not really know what the LPI was. So I went there in 1990 and uh, Two months later, uh, well, I interviewed, uh, I was offered a position. And when I went there, and, and in those days, it was at the West Mansion, which has since been torn down. I fell in love with the place and the people there. And, and I'm still there today. And I can't think of a better place to work. Uh, it's just uh, fantastic. Um, and I immediately took the offer, by the way. So there was no hesitation there. Um, and LPI, I didn't really understand this at the, at the time, but LPI proved to be a superb place to develop, improve, and use the topographic and cartographic mapping skills that I was subsequently able to employ. Uh, the uh, three color and topographic maps of Enceladus, for example, are, are classic examples of that. It was just uh, wonderful. So in a sense, the JPL failure opened up this key LPI opportunity, which in turn opened up additional opportunities because those mapping skills that I developed and used at the LPI did not go unnoticed. So in 2013, I was invited to be a New Horizons COI, and that was uh, in principle to lead the cartographic effort at Pluto and Charon, which was due to happen uh, in 2015 in order to produce the uh, global and uh, well, the global uh, cartographic products, including the base map and the topographic map, the topographic maps of Pluto and its moon you see at the left, uh, I'm sorry, at the right. The topographic maps were particularly key because they showed us that the bright uh, ice deposit on the that formed uh, Sputnik Planitia as actually a three kilometer deep basin. And there's, an, there's also a north-south trough that cuts across the surface from here up through here. And Charon uh, has a surprising amount of relief. It's got a fractured uh, northern plains and a southern lowlands and 18 kilometers of relief from its deepest points, uh, including these canyons up north to its highest uh, uh, elevated block. So uh, the topography is, in, is turned out again to be key in interpreting the geology. Uh, the greatest, the highlight of that was the unveiling of the first resolved global Pluto mosaic uh, during the encounter, uh, like a week or so after the encounter, we had enough images to put together to produce the map. And the unrolling of that map in, in the uh, uh, and the geology working group uh, headquarters, the center where we worked in, the room we worked in rather, uh, was it was just an unforgettable moment because here we are uh, unveiling this planet for the first time in its global uh, uh, 
its global uh, characteristics is just everything, all the training and experience of the previous decades seem to all converge at that, uh, that point in time. And I want to thank Jeff Moore and Alan Stern for making that possible. Uh, in fact, you'll notice that the maps ended up being distributed uh, in globes, and I'm still waiting for my royalty checks from Sky and Telescope, but they haven't arrived yet. But um, be that as it may, um, uh, it's hard to really top that in, in terms of career, unless you count being on the cover of Stereo World magazine. Uh, I don't know what else there is left to accomplish after something like that, but uh, I'll, I'll try and think of something. Uh, but uh, okay, so stepping back, you know, after a 30 year career, one might ask, why haven't I ever been a mission or instrument PI? Well, there are several reasons. Uh, one is that a good PI, a great PI, PI, needs to know what is going on at all levels. And there are other talents that he also needs. But, but this is a skill I profoundly lack. And unfortunately, as my colleagues know, um, I don't always know what's going on. Uh, but I, I, it gives me an opportunity to thank and uh, offer my admiration to all the PIs and project scientists that I've worked with over the years uh, on Cassini and uh, New Horizons, on Dawn, uh, Galileo, Voyager. They've all been just superb examples of, of leaders, and, and I offer my, my humble thanks and admirations to them. The second reason is that my real passion is in cartography and stereo. I just enjoy being in the trenches, making mosaics, uh, elevation maps, anaglyphs. Uh, I just, I really like getting my hands dirty and, and I don't want to give that up. And, and I, that's just where I prefer to be. So uh, I, I want to thank the AGU and again, John Spencer for recognizing the importance of cartography it is a fundamental foundation of planetary science. The geologic patterns we see in the maps and the mosaics that are produced from our planetary missions reveal a host of geologic phenomena. And I'm not going to read through this list. There are so many. These are the, some of the ones that I've had a direct role in. But it's also uh, the anomalies that show up in these maps and the seemingly unrelated connections that are made when mapping uh, that are also important, not just the obvious ones. And uh, one I want to call out here is the crater chains on Ganymede and Callisto, which puzzled us for quite a while after Voyager observed them because they didn't seem to uh, have a source crater. Normally, a crater chain is thought of as a secondary uh, phenomenon from a, a primary crater. It was not until the slick comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9 was observed in 1993 that the connection was made that these linear chains of small objects are what produce many of these crater chains on Callisto and Ganymede, uh, providing actually a, a preserved record of some of these events in the long distant past, which is quite an interesting phenomenon. So in a sense, uh, you know, remember the award is named after Fred Whipple, who was a famous worker uh, who, who uh, came up with some interesting hypotheses for, for comets. So in a sense that uh, I actually have worked on comets, so it's actually sort of appropriate, I guess. None of this was easy. And so uh, just to, to reiterate some of the things that I've talked about is that perseverance is important in all things. Good ideas and careers often face tests, road bumps, and detours. Uh, rely on the guidance of your mentors and friends. Feed your curiosity, interrogate all the data sets, follow all leads. Seek out co colleagues who can complement your skills in interpreting those data sets. And finally, make opportunity happen. Opportunities are born not only of hard work, uh, but also from skill and timing and a little bit of luck sometimes uh, can play a role in that too. So uh, we can also send perseverance, curiosity, and opportunity to the outer solar system. We will ultimately need to send instruments to the icy surfaces uh, uh, of the outer solar system uh, when the technology is available because we have fundamental problems regarding the absolute ages 
of these surfaces. We have very poor constraints on those. Uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty on in terms of what the ice composition and the non-ice composition of these uh, surfaces is. And the nature of the oceans beneath them is also uh, very poorly constrained. Dragonfly, the approved mission, the illustration that is shown on the, on the left, it's a great start, but we're going to need direct sampling and sounding of the ocean worlds to really understand them. And there are uh, a large number of these uh, ocean worlds out there. And uh, I think it, I would certainly support any effort uh, to begin meeting those uh, objectives now in terms of designing uh, affordable uh, missions to the outer solar system that will actually land on the surface and address some of these questions. Uh, it turns out I actually have explored an ancient, uh, sorry, uh, an alien ocean world, and that happens to be our own ocean world. Uh, and as you can see, uh, I've been using diving equipment uh, for quite a few years, and uh, it's been great fun doing that. It's a wonderful place uh, to explore. You get to see all sorts of fun things, and you actually, it's actually very peaceful. Uh, it does require teamwork, uh, communications, navigations, preparation to do all those things, and it provides some interesting similarities and also differences uh, between the diving using this kind of equipment and moonwalking on alien worlds. But in a sense, it will be up to the next generation to really explore these uh, ocean worlds and to answer some of the riddles uh, using new approaches and building on our 50-year uh, foundation of science exploration. And almost done, I want to offer my deepest thanks to the LPI staff for their support and for their tolerance of my uh, aberrations and peculiarities, and for their unfailing dedication to planetary exploration. None of this work would have been possible without them. And finally, uh, I consider myself uh, most privileged and fortunate to have explored uh, the distant icy worlds of the outer solar system with all of you, uh, even if I have to do it remotely today. Uh, failures were a key part of that. And failure is an interesting thing. If it is used wisely, it educates, informs. Uh, it also opens up doors that you didn't know were still open to you. It can pave the road to success and it often tells you who your friends are. So with that, I thank you and uh, I'll be happy to answer uh, questions. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. That was a very illuminating talk. And um, if there are people who would like to ask questions, please just simply unmute your mic and um, take turns um, asking Paul whatever you'd like to know about. Hi, Paul, it's Lisa. Hi. I'm a little surprised <clears throat> that you didn't mention your role in, um, in uh, chairing the Cardo review panel and the development of some of the tools that you used and um, your efforts to make sure that both you and the community had, had the capability to process some of the data that, you're, that you've been using for so many years. Uh, there are many things that, that I left off, and yes, I do remember those uh, those trips to Flagstaff very very fondly. Uh, Lisa is referring to uh, an oversight uh, panel that um, uh, uh, determined you know what efforts were done in cartography and what uh, tools were developed, and uh, I served on that panel for for s several years and then chaired it for several years. Uh, and those were very important exercises uh, because uh, a lot of the tools um, uh, were, that are currently used were developed as a result of those. 
the tools that I used were developed here specifically at the LPI and were separate from those that were developed at the USGS, for example. Uh, uh, and there are different reasons for that, but um, uh, which you know, I won't get into right right now. But um, uh, part of it was my lack of uh, mathematical skills. But um, uh, but yeah, those uh, those efforts are um, uh, are ongoing, uh, and we, we continue to develop uh, new and uh, and better uh, cartographic skills every day. So. Um, and, and the, the tools we use today will look antiquated in 50 years, I'm sure. Uh, I hope that answers that. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Ed Rivera Valentin. Hey, Paul. First off, this was such an awesome talk. I loved it. I love the inspiration. I love the quotes. I love the falling back on failure as a positive. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for this. Um, I wanted to bug you about your thoughts on what are the, what you see as the potential future highlights, right? We're sending off Dragonfly, we're sending off Europa Clipper. Like, let's get super uh, inspirational and imaginative in what type of future science are you most looking forward in outer solar system exploration? Ooh. Um... Oh, uh, um, that's an interesting question. Um, there are a whole bunch of stuff in the long term. And, and this is, as I suggested earlier, is going to require advanced planning and new technologies is to actually go to the surfaces of uh, many of the icy bodies that are most interesting. Uh, Perhaps sample acquisition uh, key is age determination because the constraints on how old these surfaces are and when key events such as uh, tidal heating or volcanism or any of the, or, or fracturing, whenever those things happen, is is those constraints are are not great. Um, in the near term. Uh, clearly, you know, going back to Europa is going to be very exciting uh, and determining whether or not the Europa is currently active. Uh, and some of the other satellites like Ariel uh, orbiting Uranus, for example, is that body which has some uh, young surfaces, is that active? Um, uh, going back to uh, Triton, which we almost did, uh, uh, with advanced instrumentation is going to be one of the most interesting things I, I can think of. Uh, plus, we have all sorts of other objects in the outer solar system. The Kuiper Belt. Uh, New Horizons opened up the Kuiper Belt for the first time by visiting Pluto and the small body Erikoff. And Erikoff is about the size of a one single mountain on Pluto, which gives you a sense of scale. But it showed that the Kuiper Belt is nothing like we thought it was. So um, opening up the Kuiper Belt to exploration the way we have the asteroid belt, I think is going to be very fundamental. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Okay, then I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you, Paul, for a very illuminating talk. And um, on behalf of all of your friends and colleagues at LPI, congratulations on a very well-earned award. Thank you, thank you. And that will wrap up today's presentation. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs>